later that year, in October, Edward was born. So, um, so George was only Reeve for the one year. July in 1924, he resigns as postmaster. And he's no longer running the store. Um, he and his family moved to Burnett Street. Uh, George, uh, Georgette was born, Helen's mother, and his brother-in-law, Wilford Duplan, husband of Denora, which we saw at the slide very early there, George's sister, they take over the store, mm -hmm. and um, Wilford is postmaster until 1930. So we sort of wondered why, why did he give up the store, what was going on there, and so in Tony Perry's book, it does give an indication that, as was the custom in those days, most uh, stores would allow their customers to put their purchases on a charge basis, as most people in Millardville worked at the mill and got paid monthly. The store is expected to be reimbursed for the outstanding amount owing at that time. This was far from the norm as many on payday would come for, to the store and pay only a portion of the outstanding balance. If the store owner threatened to cut off the customer's mm -hmm. credit, the customer would simply tell him that he was taking his business elsewhere. If this happened, the store owner would be stuck with an uncollectible debt. So in an effort to keep their clientele and keep the business going, the merchants would keep on granting credit. It was a catch-22 situation where the store owner, who had no option but to pay cash to his suppliers for his purchases, sooner or later became bankrupt. So in 1924, the store on the verge of bankruptcy, the above situation had caught up with the Prue's family business. So Wilford Duplan became the manager in order to reserve, reverse the situation and improve the family venture. Duplan was barely managing to keep the business afloat when in 1930 the store and the company records were completely destroyed by a fire. Again, there's a question about the date there, but anyway, so um, that sort of tells it. And then we wonder if George and Fabiana were maybe living the high life too much <laughs> after meeting the president. So don't know. Then uh, no births that year. But 1926, to make up for the year of no oh, we births, got <laughs> we've got twins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of them was um, Yvonne's mother, Alma, and her sister, Rose. And so I, My mother told me Yes. it was because the, nur the nurses sort of told her exactly what was going on, and so she kind of banished him from the bedroom for a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess when she finally relented, then uh, <laughs> twins. <laughs> twins. <laughs> and the, the twins have unique names: Rose Alma and Rose Alba. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one was called Alma, and one was called Rose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my understanding: my mother was Rose. 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 Rose um, Alba. Uh, twin, and I understood uh, Alba and Alma is turned white and red, mm -hmm. so one was white rose, okay. and one was mm -hmm. red rose. Oh, interesting. Did you hear that one? Oh. Yes, I did. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you're right. Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, next slide, please. 1927. Um, in the Coquitlam Council meeting minutes, it says George was appointed deputy returning officer. And this is the only picture we have, George with all eight <coughs> children. We don't have a picture... Yeah. 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 We don't have a picture of Fabiana with all eight children. So... She's probably having a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. So, I think this was maybe about 1926, 27, by looking at the it twins. Like the, two or three. Yeah, yeah, so something around there. Okay. Um, moving on, um, we have George Prue doing a lot of uh, trench work again, a lot of waterworks. Um, he put a tender in for Smith Road and it was accepted, and then there was a penalty of $25 a day if he was late. So, 
And then, um, according to the BC Legislative Assembly, capital accounts, George had contracts, um, various contracts from 1928 to 31 for installing a second ho pump house at Colony Farm and at the North Bend Lockup. And they were for $1,000 and $1,300. So. Mm. Then 1931 um, is the strike at the Fa Fraser Mills, which was two and a half months long. Wages had declined dr dramatically, and some of the men, uh, some of the striking men were arrested. But the strike was considered successful overall as the wage decline was stopped and it laid the groundwork for the formation of the union. However, uh, Mackin, who was the general manager of the mill, fired some of the union men and blacklisted others. And this set a polarization between the workers and the management, um, which will lead us up to Edward's information in a little bit. But before that, Gloria to present. It appears that George, our grandfather, was uh, an entrepreneur and maybe a little scandalous at times in, in his uh, work th working things. So right across the street we have Woody's, which originally was the Woods Hotel. Now, through the storytelling, we all, some of the older cousins thought that we, that our grandfather actually was part owner, but his name has not come up in any of the records. So doing a bit of the searching and history, history on that, we do think he was a, an integral part of its development. Prohibition in BC was 1917 to 1921. So booze and illegal drinking establishments, establishments were in the background. And we all know that they had the background rooms in the Prue store and uh, Dick was telling me that they even had a mahjong room for the Chinese people mm -hmm. as well as the regular poker games. So he was very uh, good at being an entrepreneur. Um, there was still, there was, even though Prohibition ended in 21 in BC, uh, it it was still nationwide and in the states as well. So there was very strict rules about alcohol. You couldn't, you couldn't have it in your establishments. So I think in the background they were doing this Woods Hotel thing and uh, it's listed as a warehouse before it actually became the Woods Hotel. So probably in this warehouse things were happening. And then not too long after Prohibition ended in 1921, George entered into politics. And in order to prepare his life in politics, he had to divest himself of his ownership association with the public house, with the establishment of uh, the alcohol and things like that. So we understood he stepped away from whatever was going on in the warehouse. And then, so in 1923, he became a Coquitlam Reeve for one year. And then further, in 1932, we skipped a lot of years in there, but again, the stories aren't always there. He applied to the city council for a beer license. Louise is just amazing at finding all these old stories. And he applied to Coquitlam City Council for a beer license at, to open a hotel expanding the building at 935, that warehouse. City Council fe felt that they wouldn't be objectionable, but they didn't grant it at that point, but George would have the responsibilities to fulfill to obtain it down the road. We believe he was renewing his partnership with the Woods, the, the people that own the building, in preparation to the USA repealing prohibition in 1933. While anticipating the granting of the license, George hit the pavement or dirt roads and went door to door getting a petition signed to allow the liquor establishment. Uh, Given the history of the back room at the Prue General Store, as I say, there's probably the liquor sales were already happening, but he had, he, now they were making it official because Prohibition had ended. It was during this time George was hit financially, uh, hit with hard times financially as well, again. <laughs> and in fact, he had to apply for City Council to City Council for relief. And in the meeting, 
minutes, it says he was denied. Counselor Clark, though, himself hired George to provide cut and cut wood for him. So rather than giving him relief, he hired George. Uh, the story is passed down that when George was out campaigning for the Woods Hotel establishment, from being out in the weather elements, he came down with pneumonia and he never recovered. He passed away May 1934 before the Woods officially opened its doors. In 1934, the records show that Mr. Woods and Mr. Houle are registered owners of the property and in 1935, the Woods Hotel was formed. It's now known as Woody's and it's still a thriving drinking food establishment at the same address. And when you look on the website, it says established 1932. So I think while George wasn't on the, re on the register, he was totally involved in it. Yeah. And our Auntie Alice, George's daughter, um, she lived till 95, 94, 94, just passed away in the um, she actually, um, when I talked to her the last time, she, yes, we had the first beer license in Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. Very proud of that. So, so the story comes down is that we were part of it, but back right, officially, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that same year, George is listed as a cement worker, living at 1409 Burnett. So that was their family home, and then. Um, uh, we've, okay, the, um, in 1933, uh, Mr. Edwards and the council said that Schoolhouse Road was in a very bad condition and that the culvert was washed out near G. Prue gravel pit. So first we heard that we had a gravel, gravel pit, pit yeah. so <laughs> whatever. Anyways, um, later that year, December 15th, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So this is. So Edward Prue was born October 6, 1923. He was. I didn't write down which. So 1923. He's kind of in the middle, right? Kind of in the middle of the children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was older than the twins. Yeah. Yes. He was older than Georgetta, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> So he, w he was born in 1923, and sadly, at the age of 10 years old, he lost his life in a tragic accident while playing with his brothers and sisters and friends. On a snowy, fun-filled evening, the family was out sledding. The sleigh run was down King Edward Avenue across Burnett towards Fraser Mills, so just down here. And when he was sledding down, he crashed into somebody who was coming up, back up the run. The runners on the sleigh, you know, the big curl runners and, yeah, you know, to make your sleigh go fast, pierced through Edward's throat, severing his carotid artery. If you can imagine what that would look like, blood everywhere. His brothers and sisters brought him to the nearest house, which was the superintendent of Fraser Mills. And you, you can imagine that blood was gushing everywhere and everybody was panicked, but the superintendent and his wife refused to allow Edward in the house. What? So the story passed down to us is that Edward died on the very steps of the Mackin house. But the newspaper article says he died at the hospital. When, as soon as he got to the hospital, <laughs> he died. So. <laughs> Well, our, our story has. So the house is situated at the corner of Burnett and Marmont. It's now the Mackin House Museum. So we feel the ghosts when we walk yeah. up the stairs there. <laughs> our parents always held a grudge against that family, blaming them for Edward's death. Now, it probably wouldn't have changed anything because when, how, I don't know how the ambulances worked and it was snowing and how they got him to the, the hospital anyways. So, and many years, many years later, when the next generation wanted to go out sledding, one of Edward's uh, aunties, <coughs> so Auntie Alice, <laughs> his sister, or his sister, yes, his sister, one of uh, yes, one of Edward's sisters, Alice wouldn't let her children, Francie and Dick, they're not here with us tonight, but they wouldn't weren't allowed to use a typical sleigh with the runners, so 
they had to have a, a sleigh made especially for them. And I guess Edward's sleigh was gr red. They had to have a green sleigh. And they weren't allowed to have curled runners. Well, that's what makes you go fast through the snow. So they were runners were cut off, and there was a board across there. <laughs> You could just imagine Dick was real thrilled. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a terrible sleigh and it didn't work, taking all the fun out of the sledding. Yeah. <laughs> and at first we thought, oh, it's because they were French, they wouldn't let him in, but then we talked to Kendrina. We talked to some people at Mackin House and, and they were saying, no, it was probably more a class thing. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, but... Anyways. Although the British were on the top, the French were next, and then different other nationalities, and they all paid differently too. Everybody yes, had at the mill. Yeah. But, but to be on the nice side, if you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You might have a lot of them in your house. Right? <laughs> anyway, so that's the first tragedy there, and then 1934. Um, according to the minutes of the council again, George is uh, selling cedar poles and so he, his offer was accepted but by May that year he died of pneumonia. So an early death and um, yeah, he was only 53 yeah. when he died. Yeah. Yeah. My mother used to tell the story though, that he did not want to live past the age of Really? He just had this thing about getting older, mm -hmm. so she wasn't terribly surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of fits in with that risky lifestyle. Mm -hmm. you don't want to live past 50. Mm -hmm. kind of things like that killed people in those days. I mean, like pneumonia, yeah. 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 They didn't in those days. Mm -hmm. yeah. So November that year, Fabiana applies to council for a uh, widow's pension. So yeah, so um, considering that, that um, he dies at the age of 53 and his wife, Fabiana, who's only 50 at the time, is still mourning the death of her eight-year-old six months ago, is now faced with the death of her husband. And she's now got seven children uh, between the ages of eight and 15. So the 15-year-old was already working at the mill and this led then to the two, the next two in line. Um, Francis, who was 14, and Gerald, who was 13, had to then quit school to go to work. And so this would be a very difficult time. And I could think that um, it would be very, our grandmother would be a very proud woman to, to then have to ask for, for any assistance. Um, the probate of George's will does show that, that he had three properties in Millardville but it didn't say um, what they were. It does say, though, that her debts far outweighed any kind of income and her assets that she had. So she went to council to ask for relief. And it's so the application for the mother's pension, it's called. So um, the minutes show that, um, I'll just read that, Councillor Hart reported that her son was working at the mill and was receiving about $63 a month. So uh, another counselor, Clark, suggested that in view of the amount the son was earning, that she be given $15 a month pension relief. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when you think about that, you, you know. But, uh, and then it was removed by counselor Quadling and seconded by counselor Smith that the clerk to notify the, the superintendent of welfare in closing a copy of application for her mother's pension of Mrs. Prue for approval regarding this case, and uh, which was carried and laid to rest. That that was what she was getting. So to to get sixty five dollars a month from one son working and then to be given a fifteen dollar a month extra, pretty hard to to feed the, a family of um, with with that many children. And I would think it would be very difficult to, to have to go out and ask for assistance in that regard. Especially having your husband been once the Once mayor, mayor, yeah, and, and you know, fairly well off and, and having to go through all the, the different uh, stages of, of um, prosperity in the family. I remember mom saying, because she was the oldest girl, and uh, she would have to go to New West. And, and I, I don't know if it was during school or in the summers, but there was a, a cannery 
No, it was up. It was winter because it was bo uphill both ways. Yeah. <laughs> bare feet in the snow. <laughs> and so she she would work in the cannery, and she said like you would go there, and I, I think it was probably in the 30s. Or, but there all be these people wanting to work that day, and she said she at 13 has grown as tall as she was as an adult, and they knew her and they knew mom grandma's situation that that the father had died, so they'd always look and pick her, and she'd try to hide behind people, and they'd always pick her, and then she had to go and work canning tomatoes, boiling, the, you know. She never ate another tomato ever again. She hated tomatoes, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trying to support the family, yeah. Yeah, another story that, that my parents told me, too, um, my, my dad, when he came to Millardville, they were farmers, and so they knew how to feed a family by having chickens in the back and making bread and things like that. And from what I understand, probably because we were a, a more wealthy family, that grandma didn't know how to do some of that to feed the family. Yeah. And but um, I was speaking with one of, one of my other um, cousins who's down in the States. Can, um, she was saying that her mother told her that um, as a young girl, that granny had chickens. And, and, and it, it, she, and so what she's got here is that she made ladies fashionable hats and would trade them for other goods. Um, in their teens, mom and her sisters, Frances and Georgette, would have to gather the eggs each day and they dreaded having Granny send them down with egg pails in hand to the Collisters downtown to trade for peanut butter and other such staples that they needed. And then those laying hens were stewed all day long on the stove for supper. Mom said the reason she never learned to cook was because they were scarce and they couldn't afford to have any cooking failures. <laughs> <laughs> but they had to do other you things see that, too. That's the difference in the stories. Yes. Uh, to me, they, my family, my mom and dad told me that they didn't have chickens. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they dad. Didn't <laughs> I think everybody, I think, in, in Millardville, and maybe it was during the strike, really struggled with with food, and they had soup kitchens, and, and uh, the women had to help. And But I remember Mom also talking about, uh, with the, the guys coming on the railway, you know, the, the guys that were out of work, looking for work, and they always had to find a plate for them. The, if they knocked on the door, Hungry, you always try to find some food for always them. Always had a soup pot going. Yeah, so yeah, soup. yeah. So, do you have for mine for my little chores? I don't have too much more to say, but I do remember Mom talking about in the years where the girls, or the kids, went to school to a Catholic school, up to the age of twelve or thirteen. I don't know if it was grade eight or something like that. And then they had to go to the English school. Well, our grandmother at that point had very little money. And these girls to go to school, those were still too young to go out and work at 13. I mean, and so the, the priest would come by, have tea for the school year, and pick out different pieces of silver, teapot, and stuff like that. So everything disappeared over the few years because they had to pay for the girls' education somehow. But mom also used to talk about the fact that they, she didn't remember, of course she was young, starving for food because they had the store was there that was I guess more or less the family store and that's maybe where some stock disappeared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we all have different stories and different memories. Yeah. We heard the twins got all the food. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. yeah that's right. They got the milk each day. Yeah, yeah they got the food. Well they were dressed up identically because they were identical and put on display a lot too that mom didn't like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, Steve wrote, Roberta's sister, that the brother. twins were. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that the twins were mere image twins. That's right, that's right. So one's left handed, one's right handed. If you look in the mirror, you're the same, but. And your part on your hair is the, is yeah. matches each other when you look in a mirror. Yeah. And I'd never heard of that before until. And I Googled it. No. It's, and, and they were psychic each other. They, they knew what would happen to the other person. Of course, they changed places in class sometimes too, but my mother was sitting at her desk one day and all of a sudden she, she yelled out, duck. And my Aunt Rose ducked. 
because she'd had a she'd had a head injury, and if she'd been hit on the head, like the nuns were quite brutal in some classrooms, sometimes they just whacked the kids over the back of the head, and that could you know that could have seriously hurt her even more. But they did that a lot. And my mom, they were standing on the sidewalk one day, and and she reached over and took her sister and shoved her. She hadn't. She would have been run over by a car. All these different things. This picture. Um, we believe is about 1935 or 1936, and it's my dad on the left. He's wearing a sweatshirt that says Thrift's Market, so we believe that he was probably working at Thrift's Market <laughs> then, um, so he'd be 15, 16. Next to him is Arthemis, so that's his grandmother, and then Fabiana, and then the oldest brother, Amy, Amy Jr. Okay, and so this is the only good picture we have of him as a teenager or adult. Um, so at this point, in 1937, Amy died. So Amy, the tall one there, he was born in 1918 and he was the first born child of Georges and Fabiana. And when he was 18 years old, in December 1936, while driving on Kingsway in Vancouver, he hit a parked car. I don't have any history of why he hit a parked car or anything like that, but he sustained very bad injuries and his spinal cord was injured and he was paralyzed. So he was in the hospital and the family would visit him to cheer him up and he was a smoker and they would put the cigarettes between his lips so he could keep smoking and puffing away. <laughs> he was in the hospital for over six months before he succumbed to his injuries in June of 1937. So he was predeceased by his little brother Edward four years earlier and by his father George three years earlier, survived by his mother, one brother and five sisters. 1939, World War II, um, Francis is listed as a clerk for Mrs. Pett, and Jerry is um, a mechanic at Albest Garage, and that's our dad, Jerry, there. 1940, it says Francis is a saleswoman, and Jerry is a student, which is the first we heard. Never heard. But we think maybe he was an apprentice a mechanic or something, yes. oh, or yes. maybe they were trying to keep him out of the war effort, being the only son left. He always told me he only went to grade eight. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. is typical. I've got mm -hmm. down yeah. to like mm -hmm. coming from at least Millardville. I think that's they had to go out and work at that time. Right? Yeah. They were probably the size of men. You go out and make your living. Right? That's right. October 6, 1942. My dad, Jerry, wrote this letter to my mom about the difficulties getting married to a non Catholic during the war. My mom kept this letter and every letter that he wrote to her from during the war. And uh, it also gives me a really different view of my father, <laughs> one I never saw. So it starts off, Dear Irene, Hello dear, how are you doing these days? <laughs> Just like me, running around in circles? Say dear, I finally saw the Padre, and did he ever put me up on a thing or two? According to the Catholic Church, no Catholic can get married in any other church but the Catholic Church. If he does, he's excommunicated or something. I'm really waiting to see how Mother can take it. You know, I'd hate to hurt her feelings. But again, on the other side, we can get married in the Presbyterian Church, and afterwards, we can both turn Catholics. It has been done. Oh yes, Irene, can I get married with you in your church without having to belong to it? Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my spot here now. <laughs> Did you get those two letters of reference? You'll need an affidavit signed by two witnesses stating you have not married before and a birth certificate too. You can bring these with you when you come. By golly, darling, <laughs> do you think we can make it for the 24th? I hope so, because on the 24th, I'll be on a 48 or possibly a 72, plus a couple days to get married. <laughs> I'll bet you can't guess where I am now. I'm writing this letter from Aunt Annonciades in Montreal. 
I've just told her about getting married. She's religious too, but doesn't seem to think it's so awfully bad to get married in Presbyterian. <laughs> well, anyhow, Irene, we'll see what goes on in a few days. Damn it anyways. I think the government should take the marrying away f privileges away from the church and let the civilian courts handle it, don't you? <laughs> I think I'll close for now, darling. Keep your chin up. Yours as ever, love Jerry. So they did get married in the Presbyterian Church and on the 24th and um, Fabiana must have been okay with it. <laughs> she didn't disown him. <laughs> Father. No, I never heard him call my mom dear. <laughs> but it's nice to know that he was he like that. So he did. We, we, when we went through all our parents' stuff and everything, it was there in a trunk. She had a trunk mm -hmm. and she had kept oh. so many things, all sorts of keepsakes, different oh. things. And all the letters that he had written to her were there. And um, then we stored things away and then just well, last she was year for yeah that invitation yes she was looking for that invitation yeah. and came across this letter again oh. so we thought yeah, well we could share it yeah. Yeah. since i have no memories of fabiana she yeah. died mm -hmm. the month i was born and so, so. she's called fate <laughs> yeah. a couple of, of our uncles were, were english and, and as irene was was english their last names were drink water. So, but in those days, it was Father Tech, and um, you you had to convert if you wanted to marry a, a Catholic girl. So, he, they would have to go to church, and they had to go six or eight times and convert. And they'd be sitting in the church, and Father Tech would be yelling at them, saying, "You're taking our good Catholic girls. All these Englishmen are taking our girls." And they had to stay there because they had to convert. And they wanted to marry them, so he would be yelling at them through the whole ceremony. Well, Dad was excommunicated, and he would never—he never stepped in a church again, except when we got married. Yeah. You know, yeah. he never went to church again. Yes, the church was very strict back then. Oh yeah. My mother, neither did he. They didn't go to church after. Yeah, yeah. And we, when I was young, I went to Our Lady of Fatima, and so did Gloria, and every son, every Monday, you'd have to raise your hand from grade one to grade, I was there till grade eight, and say, did you go to church that morning? And I was, there was probably two of us that never, ever raised our hand. I never got to raise my hand saying I went to church, and it was a big deal, I wanted to, because everybody was going. We went to Allard Street Baptist Church. Yeah. You didn't, but you weren't born yet, but. So, yeah. They made sure that you were, you were, you wanted to go to church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it was nice. He was concerned about his mother's feelings. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 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 Okay. So um, this is still 1942. Georgette is listed as working at Ray's. So in this photograph, we do have Georgette right in the middle, and Francis is on the right. And so four sisters were working there. And okay. They they all sort of ended up. Ray's was in New Westminster, I think. Okay. And it was a big grocery store. So they worked there. Uh, and I think it was during the war as well, because the women had to sort of take over. The men were gone. They had to do some of the, the, those jobs. Probably the first years that women actually went out of the house and started working at, at those ages. Okay. So four of the sisters are, are there working at Ray's. Oh, I love this picture. <laughs> okay. So, and yeah, um, this picture we think is prior to 1942, but not much before then. So um, that's Fabiana in the middle with the remaining six children. And um, interesting, my cousins who have mothers there call it the leg pitcher. And we who have a father there, we call it the sock pitcher. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, OK, and then 1943, BC Directory lists Fabiana as a widow, Georgette, clerk at Ray's, Rose, saleswoman at Spencer's, um, and living at 413 12th Street. We knew they had moved to 12th Street. And Ed Godden is listed at 413 12th Street as well. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, later that year, Fabiana and Ed get married. So that's a year after mm -hmm. 
mom and dad. 1944, Ed and Fabiana Godden are listed as Mr. and Mrs. on 12th Street. So I don't know, did Francie say anything about Alice working in Fraser Mills? No, no. okay, because there are some, are some stories about her carting four by eight plywood and stuff like that. Okay, this is a picture at BC Distilleries and so Rose is in there. We're not sure if Alma's in there too, but apparently they were both they working were there at mm -hmm. some time, yeah. yeah. Well, Bass, that's the Labatt's Breweries, which is just... Is that what it is now? By the hospital, was, I think. Oh, okay. Used to be, yeah. yeah. Used to be, yeah. They worked at Seagram's. <coughs> oh, did they? Yeah. Where's, yeah. Where's okay. The that Seagram's is where Labatt's is. It's oh, a corner okay. where the SkyTrain yeah. is now. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. That's yeah. where they worked, yeah. Okay. So, then 1952, Fabiana had a heart attack. Um, next picture, please. And um, this picture was taken, we believe, in 1953. So there are the daughters and daughter-in-law and a lot of the grandchildren there with her. Yeah, but it's, people in my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at the front. So. It seems to be 1953, so she sort of looks in okay health then, but sometime later she was um, confined to a wheelchair. And um, this is when you so would have met her. That, most of us yeah. are in that picture there. Not, so not me. Not, not, not me. Not us young ones. <laughs> the older ones are up there. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> somebody mentioned that they thought she made dandelion wine in her basement? Oh, she did. I, I, okay, there. I, Dad told us that. Okay. At least, I don't know for sure, but Dad told us that. Okay, yeah. So, okay, yeah, okay. So, I don't know, if there are any other memories of Fabiana at that time? Very, no, I mean, I don't think she talked to us. Yeah. She wasn't friendly. Yeah. Like mom's mom, Gran, mm -hmm. I, re I remember her much more clearly. Okay. And she died early too. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, Bonnie just said she remembered her going there and she mm -hmm. was, at that time, she was confined to her mm -hmm. wheelchair and couldn't yeah. get out. And I know uh, Faye and I not, used to play friendly. in the wheelchair afterwards. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And you know, I don't remember ever getting a Christmas present from her. Hmm. Often I do remember Christmas presents, like yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I remember. So next picture, 1955. Um, Fabiana died at age 68. Um, she had a heart attack. She had diabetes for 10 years. So. But family gatherings continued for many years until the families got too large. We had Christmas Eve, Boxing Day, New Year's Eve. That's New Year's Eve, and mm -hmm. there's the top hat. Mm -hmm. And our cousin Francie wanted to remind us that they always made a point of recognizing their French, her French heritage by singing some French songs. Mm -hmm. Alouette. Yeah. But there was always singing and, and... And if you didn't have an instrument, you got a thumper. Mm -hmm. Thumper, oh yeah, yeah. They said there, there was lots of... Um, said that there, it was a... Or New Year's Eve was a, was a costume party for them, and, and so there was a lot of... Um, Costume, homemade costumes, Dr. Kildare, Dr. Casey said uh, um, engineers and gypsies and the music would start, one would be on the piano, Cliff would be on the guitar, and Carl would be on the saxophone, Ken on the ukulele, and so it was a very, very musical um, uh, a group and they, they knew how to have a good time with the beer flowing. Yeah. Oh, of beer. Yeah. Have you got a picture of a thumper? Or? Yeah. I didn't put it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so this is a lot of us mm -hmm. um, at, uh, this is the Christmas after Fabiana died and our family, Jerry's family, moved into that house that Fabiana had in New Westminster. And uh, we kept those Christmas Eve parties going for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So, and we still have a lot of those traditions going on. Um, next one. Hmm. Okay, so there's a picture of Jerry and Georgette, and they were invited to the Coquitlam Council to have a picture taken with their dad, and that was 1991. 
Okay, next picture. So this, this is all the cousins from the reunion we had in 2011, just over 100 years from when they came out from uh, Quebec. Um, Alice, his daughter, is in that picture as well. The, she was the only remaining one there. Um, two of our cousins are photoshopped into that picture <laughs> because they couldn't make it. And that's taken on the church steps, right? That's right, that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah. Okay, next one. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Through long, hard struggles from 2011, um, at that during the reunion, we had a petition to get a street named after our grandfather, our family, and so it happened last summer. So there we have it. So some success. Um, now I'm feeling we've got Mackin House, which is an English house. We need a French house museum. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I see Maurice left, but um, we talked about having a plaque where the Prue store was because Maurice does a walking tour, and um, it seems like such a shame that there's nothing there to represent it. So I want to say merci, thank you so, thank so you much. You. Uh, I'd just like to say one thing that's very important. Uh, even Richard Stewart, the mayor, one day, as sometimes people have the tendency to say Malarville in English. So I say, I, I say it very simply, I say, look, Mallard is a duck, Mayal is a priest. And I try to deliver something very important, right, in terms of how to show a sense of understanding the dynamics of this village from a certain time period. Now, your, your parents would have said Mayalville in English, and they would have said Mayalville in French. Maillardville. Yeah, they would have said Maillard. Maillard. Yeah, because they knew that it was named after Le Père Maillard. Yes. And Not uh, the what doc. I appreciate <laughs> yes. what your generation has done here today from my perspective, you reached into a depth of history from the village, the village itself, which is still looking for itself in a way. It's, it's a journey of language, it's a journey of research, but it's also that bonding that is there that was very real in this village because it was a world unto itself for a long time because the forest gave it its, uh, its identity yeah. at the edge of the forest. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I see happening, and I'm so happy when you're saying, and you're right, Joanne's dream is to see a cultural center uh, or an archive center that would bring in all of what you've collected that would go there. Uh, but I stress that the, the pronunciation of the word mm -hmm. needs to translate itself this way. And w when the little Duplain went out and spoke, what fascinated me is that the papers were intrigued that, and they did print word for word what he yes. said. And that's why I just pointed out that the yeah. paper itself was recognized on. But I really love the enthusiasm and the energy you put in. And the, the connections there are much more to come. To, go forward on that thing. And a so. good exercise that Roger has taught many of us, or not me because I knew how to say my yard, is just to say my yard. My yard. Yeah. Yeah, my yard. My yard. Thank you so much.